listen. Welcome, everybody. I uh, am grateful for the turnout. We have six of the seven town crews represented from the wild and scenic Cusatonic. Thank you for your attendance. Glad your uh, paper broke down today. No. Because uh, <laughs> no. this is more important. No. <laughs> Sorry, Webby. Okay. Um, we welcome representatives from uh, about five land trusts and four students from the horticulture and landscape classes of Dave Moran at Houstonic Valley Regional High School. The future of the case of management. Okay, we're fortunate that we have a school program there that teaches the difference between invasives and a pine tree. Uh, thank you, David. <laughs> Um, we are grateful especially to the Northwest Connecticut Community Foundation providing us with a grant to fund this event. Perhaps the first regional invasive plant management effort in the state of Connecticut. Is that overstating it? Peter, you would know. Peter Pacone is from the Connecticut DEEP and is a wildlife bio biologist and wildlife manager. Um, and habitat manager, and he, his associate is? Jerry Jelani. Okay. Uh, John Anderson from Anton Forest in Norfolk is here, and he's with the Land Trust Group. Why don't you, Tom, go down the list in the front row and say who you are and what town? Tom Sherwood, Falls Village. Brian Carlson, North Canaan. Mike Simmons, North Canaan. Eddie Burns, New Milford. Dean Newkirk, New Milford. Jim Granke, Cornwall. Webby <coughs> Salisbury. Downey Reed, Salisbury. Uh, Mike Schmidt, Sheffield. We're guys born in Kent. Give that man a label. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, next row, students. Cameron. Yeah. Uh, Cameron Pajama, senior over at Uzi. Sharon. Oh, Sharon. Uh, Robert Murtaugh, I'm a junior at Uzi. I'm from Sharon. Danielle Bura, I'm a senior from Hong Mike Hanlon, I'm a senior from Hong Kong. Thank you. Tim Hunter, Sharon Lantrust. Mike Benjamin, Kent Land Trust. Guy Robezzi, Falls Village and the Community Foundation. Mike Civic, Town of Kent. Jerry LaPointe, Town of Kent. Uh, Tim Downs, Falls Village. Frank Bonab, Manchester Land Trust. Thank you. And uh, added thanks to Tim Downs, who is our Falls Village Fire Chief and Town Crew Supervisor, uh, who, uh, along with uh, the town, has been extremely accommodating of providing us with this exquisite venue for this project. Okay, um, The grant is administered through the Houstonic Valley Association. Um, Teresa Freund is in the kitchen. Lunch will be at noon. Bob Gambino has, is the grandfather of invasive management in Litchfield County and is our principal instructor this morning. Um, Bruce Bennett of Kent Greenhouse is going to be providing, along with Christian Allen, some additional input as we go along. Uh, we are going to welcome your questions. Um, we're going to be dealing with what is in some minds a controversial topic, the use of herbicides. So the training program is going to be about judicious use of herbicides, and Bob will unfold those layers of knowledge so we don't get into trouble with an effort um, which is tackling the smartest plant on the planet that convinced guys like us to put it in his pocket and take it around the world. Um, it arrived in England in 1890, 1850, and in the United States in 1890, so 130 years ago. It decided to take over the roadsides of Connecticut, New England, Vermont, into Canada, and well beyond. Um, the part of the world that we're concerned with is the wild and scenic Cusatonic. As you can see from this map, a lot of land conservation occurs in this area. You would think the river is protected, but not from not reading. The survey of a year ago revealed that we have a manageable level of knotweed in our wild and scenic river corridor. 
And in Canaan, we did additional mapping, so it looks a little intense. A lot of that is roadside, and you'll see later how we're dealing with it. The management of the river gets more intense down in Kent, a little less in New Milford. The town of Cornwall, and Jim, we're not picking on you, um, is going to be discussed because we just had a group of residents do the mapping and there's more roadside knotweed than there is riverside knotweed in that town. The same was true in Canaan. In Canaan we started invasive management in 2016 and we have everything that circled has been treated by the DOT but mostly by Christian Allen and me and the Canaan town crew, Brian Carlson. Um, we have achieved between 70 and 90 percent kill and in some sites 100 percent kill we're down to one sprig in three years and many many sites in two years of management we're looking to preserve this landscape so it doesn't become this landscape which exists in Sheffield uh, no fisherman would appreciate going, trying to work their way through to cast a line through that stuff. Um, we're trying to prevent this from becoming this. So the way we're having to do that is intercept the knotweed, which is traveling on human vectors, on roadsides, on equipment, and contaminated fill before it gets to the river. To demonstrate that this is feasible, Bob Gambino, Christian Allen are examining the mother load of uh, knotweed in Northwest Connecticut. A year later, that was treated in 17. It was, uh, let's see, 17. This is what it looked like in 2018. Bob Gambino retreated that this spring. Uh, we're up to a 99.9% .9 kill, a damn near 100. Um, that is remarkable in that the older the infestation, the more difficult it is to kill. Bear in mind, 66% of the biomass of the plant is invisible to the human eye. It's underground. That's why this plant is so challenging. Um, along the riparian area, which is right there along the, where we were shooting from low water into the bank. Um, in 19 months after the initial treatment, we sowed seed there, conservation mix, this Agway mix, we tested four mixes, that did the best. Um, and skunk cabbage was already coming up. Last month it looked like this. We got the grass growing, we got ground cover stabilization, uh, the natives are coming back, there's a knotweed plant a third of the way in from the right. There's some other knotweed plants there. Christian is going to treat those. Maybe Bob, uh, Bruce Bennett will help uh, this uh, next, this month actually, um, once we get beyond the blossom period. And those may be done by stem injection. Christian will talk about that as well as Bob. That project was near the biological potential of the plant. It's so much cheaper and so much easier to challenge the invasives down here at early introduction, like this, okay? That would take half a cup of herbicide. And whereas we put on gallons and gallons on that big site. Um, okay, we're moving toward management options. Line of sight is important for safety reasons, and here DOT mows that, but they'll be mowing that for the next thousand years. They'll never kill it. Mowing does nothing to kill the herb, the knotweed plant unless you mow it every two weeks like a lawn, and nothing extends up more than four to six inches. So it's not a good option. Um, here is Don Webby knotweed on Farnham Road and you can see okay you're mowing down on the right side of the road and you're moving along the mower you're picking up these fragments called propagules of the plant something as small as a half an inch can reproduce um, on fertile soils um, line of sight issue 
Steve Geddes, who we would wish to have had here today, should be our collaborator and a cooperator in each of our towns um, to a very high degree. Here he has proceeded over the course of about five years to push back the knotweed. His most recent spray, you can see the stalks in the background. So that still deserves monitoring. Uh, there's little plants in there. Um, and until you get 100% kill, your job is not done. Here's an example of mowing and not mowing in Cornwall on the side of the road, DOT. What happens is you get lower plants in it by August, September. When these are still in blossom, you don't get seed production. However, the main means of reproduction is propagules from mowing, not seeds. Seeds have a high germination rate, but a low survival rate. Um, this is easy to spray when it's four feet high. It's a little more challenging when it's 12 feet high. Here, that area has recently been mowed by uh, Hopkins, uh, is that his name, the farmer? Chris. Chris, yeah. And, uh, but, shall we say, hey, it prevents, I don't know if he's aware that he can't kill it this way with a brush off, even as you know, judicious as he might be. Here is what Christian Allen considers an unprofessional approach to the Trent Treaty not wait. However, it was very effective. Brian Carlson and I, in 2016, with the support of our town government, and this $40 backpack sprayer basically took that uh, patch out. Um, we had, you can see the dye, we had re-sprouts. Christian was in there with me a couple of weeks ago, counting the number of sprouts surviving. Seven. Seven. Sorry. Okay. Um, Under four inches as well. So what, what's also going on there is na native regeneration. So once you, you open up the space, native seeds and latent seeds will regerminate. Um, the conservation mix helps that effort because it hold, it's a holding place to prevent other invasives from coming in. We had a little episode of garlic mustard. We got rid of those. Here is spraying stuff that's been cut. And uh, got up near your house on uh, your former Green Acres site. And uh, it, we, we only did one spray. We got it successfully. And um, uh, then the neighbor said, geez, I'm happy to have that out of here. I'll mow that. And uh, hey, the job was done. Um, that's, what it, and that's what it looks like. OK, here's uh, an example in Massachusetts, which is the worst case scenario of management. Because in their, shall we say, overgeneralization, the Massachusetts legislators banned the use of any herbicide on all highways in the state. So the poor guy with the over the fence mower was wondering, this stuff keeps coming back, I keep mowing it, and you know, two weeks later it's back. And, and then he's lowering the mower down, he's grinding up the roots, he's thinking he's gonna get it mechanically. And what he's doing is he's spewing these propagules into the Housatonic River up there in Risingdale. In 20 years, that whole backwater behind that dam will be lined with knotweed as a result. Bad management. Um, along the salmon kill, we want to avoid spewing any fragment of knotweed, root or stem, into flowing water or standing water, for example, where there's, after flooding, scouring like that. This on the Housatonic um, is evidence of what probably was a past example of knotweed being picked up and establishing downstream. Um, Addition, in, in those riparian areas, certain strategies for treatment are stem injection because there's no by spray. When we did the spraying on the riparian area at the Cornwall garage area, we had zero wind. We were blowing it out uh, toward the shore. Uh, we got not a droplet of herbicide into the river. It was flawless. Um, so targeting is important, prioritizing is important. Here Christian is treating not meat on the side of Route 44 because we don't want it to jump the gap of that little road and into a fertile pool where it would be a real pain to control. Um, flagging, notice that pink ribbon. Uh, everybody gets 
a roll of ribbon. When you see knotweed, flag it. Maybe your guy could come down the road, lift up the mower, go over it, not pick up fragments and transport it down, and then later let it grow to full form. If it's a line of sight issue, you're going to cut it. Um, contaminated fill, even more than mowing or equal to mowing, is the primary means of the dissemination of this plant in the landscape. Here's the DOT garage in Canaan. There's the uh, knotweed I dug out. It was growing right over the, and in the gravel. So, hey, they were just taking some gravel out of there. They're moving property with sections of root. Remember, 66% of the plant underground. Um, here we have it at the Canaan transfer station. And here we have it at the Falls Village pit. And uh, that's, Tim, that's your drainage that before you did that re construction work on um, Turnpike Road. Warren Turnpike? Yeah, yeah. And uh, where knotweed was growing, uh, and that probably mm -hmm. came in and contaminated fill. Here we are at the uh, Falls Village Firehouse, probably came in with contaminated fill. Uh, from a contractor or from your own sources, hard to know. Um, there we are down in the pit, that's where we're gonna go after Bob finishes up here and we're going to do demonstration spraying. Bob is going to teach you all about that. Um, we've, one of the environmental impacts of not we is damage to infrastructure in, in addition to the ecological damage, which is vast. And um, we have in your packets a lot of good information. What we will eventually do is take your email list and add a, a bunch of, uh, including for the students, um, PDFs so you can have those on your laptop including that thing. Um, just to review, scout road signs, photo GPS survey. Notice the maps here. There's the Canaan map, there's the Cornwall map. The Houstonic Valley Association is able to produce for your town a map of all knotweed. You just got to find someone who can go around with a GPS phone turned on and take pictures of it. They'll convert it into the map. So then you'll know uh, where the patches are, you can decide to limit mowing. You, if you mow for line of sight, you've got to clean your deck, avoid spreading uh, fragments, especially in wet areas. Early detection and rapid response could be a priority. You can get that off your list real quickly. Um, timing of treatment is critical. Late season is the most effective way to get the herbicide. You've got to get the herbicide into the root. If you're just spraying the top of the plant and having a uh, burnout of the vegetation on top, it's not killing the root. Um, year one, we're getting 70 to 90 percent kill. Then we're going back and we're using like 10 or 5 percent as much herbicide in year two. And in year three, we're down to 1 percent. We're just doing a little tidying up. And, you know, you don't even need a four gallon backpack spray. Just a little one. Time is up. Um, there we are. This is our objective. And um, you will all get this in your packet, which is describes knotweed and other invasives as well. Thank you. Bob, you're on. Well, that's it today. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, Tom has done a fantastic job uh, putting this together. And I think we should give him a round of applause now. zeal that he has and how he puts us all into the working system. So anyhow, welcome to the workshop. I'm going to vary some things here. I only have a half an hour up here to get that. Uh, I'm going to just change my venue a little bit. I'm going to talk about this stuff on the table first. You know, we all know what not we is. And I want to start down the other end. We brought in a lot of different sprayers. I just want to show you some of these, you know, piston pump up here, piston pump down the bottom. And I have that one that must have a battery in it. Uh, this is a battery operated. This one intrigued me. The least expensive, but probably the most comfortable. You know, like you buy this. 30 bucks, throw it away, take the strap, and then go put it on a better machine. But 
They're of all kinds. They all have their own adjustable nozzles. They all have um, their own, you know, what am I going? Faucet, <coughs> handle, sprayer, thing. They all have filters. And the thing I want to talk about right now is that I keep in my truck all kinds of filters. Everything for whatever equipment I have. So when I get a clog out in the field, I don't have to come home. We talked a little bit about those. You can look at them later. I particularly like the uh, electric one. We're going to put some water in those down in the back and pump them, right? Well, if we have time. Yeah. Now, some of the things about guns, just so we don't get into an argument today, my personal gun is something like this. Doesn't break my wrist. My connection is done on a hose. But these are, these are chemical resistant, either half inch or three eighths, and we put hose barbs on. So you can increase or decrease. And since you're running with a 60 pound, 60 pound pressure on most of the electric sprays, or even when you're pumping, uh, you have no reason to blow it. If you're going up to 100 or more, you have problems. Now, this is a used wand that I threw out, but I keep everything. This one was the one I used to use when I did uh, orchards and small trees. With a, you know, I do 200, 250 pound, 300 pound pressure. It's all spray systems, and if you're interested, the box, the white gun came in spray systems also, and when you look at the one that I have, you can find that unlike this, mine has a swivel. Nothing better. If you have a gun with a swivel, swivel you're going to save yourself a lot of problems in your hose. Yeah. Uh, do a lot of these people have spray tanks and spray guns that they would do that, or would you tend to use backpack sprayers for this? You know, how many uh, are using a low-pressure electric sprayer, battery-operated, with a 15 or 25-gallon tank? North Canyon has one. North Canyon? North Canyon? We've got a 200-gallon one. 200-gallon? Yeah. And what kind of pump? Electric. Electric? Both and your eight. pressure? 60. 60. <clears throat> Most of that time, we do a lot of small stories, but we won't drink the Okay. Anybody else? Back? Uh, 100 gallon Lesco. Louder? 100 gallon Lesco sprayer. Oh, that's a gasoline power? All right, I try to get away from that myself personally. Gasoline powered, unless you've got a towing good engine. I've had those for years. Uh, I did a lot of my work in aquatics, so I had to put a 25-gallon tank in a boat. I got my guy that rose up at the bow, and I'm in the back. And I got two batteries. One, and we have a motor, two, to go along, and we also have the pump. So I do not want a gasoline engine in there because I don't want to have to fiddle with the starting and the carburetor. Uh, I buy spare pumps. Sometimes I keep my spare pump system in my truck just in case it goes down. This morning I was late getting here because I'm so compulsive. I wanted to make sure, A, that it rained. You know, yeah, it'll go blah, 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 blah. And then I put water in it. B, that I got it up to pressure. Then I got in the truck and came here. So at least I know that at 7.15 this morning it rained. So when I get down in the pit, it better run. And if it doesn't, we have his spare on his truck. All right, giving you that background, that's what I really want to talk to you about, is you guys being applicators and the BS you're going to go through to uh, do a good job. So if you open up your little folder there, you get to that first thing that's a piece of paper. Was it on the right side or left side? Right. On the right side. And you go down to application techniques. 
just like a school teacher, remember. I'm going to go down these things. There are about nine of them. I want the second page. And eight of them, actually. Nine, no, nine. And uh, we're going to go real quick. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this thing on to 30 minutes. And then I'm going to turn this one on. And I'm going to try to get out of here. 30 minutes. Okay. On this sheet, I'm supposed to familiarize you all with my concept of the knowledge you need to do a good job. So if you read there, it says physiology, chemistry, agronomy, geology, meteorology, engineering, socioeconomics, public health and safety. Now, if I were going to have a course, you know, I wouldn't do it in 10 minutes. You'd be stuck in my class for a long time. But I want you to understand that every one of these we are covering and has been covered in Tom's introduction will be covered when we get here. And you've got to kind of put all of this together. It's all of your personal experiences and stuff that you should have learned in high school. And you'll be surprised at the stuff that you're going to remember. Okay, let's go to right on to public safety. You know, I just put three things on this sheet. Culverts, flowers, and open windows. You're on a road, whether you got a backpack or whether you have a, a, you know, a, a sprayer rig, and you got to spray. Now, if you're commercial, you have a, you're licensed and you have a lot of restrictions. But if I, a lot of you don't, and you're running on the town's right away, getting rid of, well, let's, let's say it is going to be not weed. Could be other things as well. Uh, all of these things are not the only things you got to worry about. Passing traffic, drift by the wind, the breeze, and its change. Might be at your back when you're spraying, and then you get down to an intersection and it's coming the other way, blows right in your face. Now, you can overspray so easily by thinking you really know what you're doing, and the next thing you know, you're contaminating a person's property. Also, children and pets. These are important things that you have to consider in public safety, and that's a responsibility that I think every town has. And even some of you uh, people that are in land trusts, if you're doing jobs like that, though you probably don't have the, you're not doing it right near the house. You may not be doing it in the water. Now remember those culverts are there because there's a stream. And if there's a stream, there's water. And if there's water, that's one of your potentials for downstream contamination. And that's something you do not want to do. So again, I run a two-man process and sometimes a three-man process. I might have an operator driving a machine like the truck or uh, in Kent, I have a track machine for Mr. Hassel. Have you ever seen that? Tracks this wide, goes right on the swamp. I sit in the back. I have a spotter, stands up, and he looks around what's in front, what's in back, if I got far enough to the left, far enough to the right, what I missed. Now sometimes when you wear a mask and you listen to me, it's hard enough to hear me now. You can't hear me with this on my face, but I want that because I never know which way the breeze is going to go. So be careful about your own safety. Now we're going to go to the next step here. NDDB. In your packet, you're going to find this map. Each town has the invasive species map. This is the one for New Milford. And it has, if you look at it, a sidebar, which you can read at your leisure, with a phone number you can call if you really want more information. What I want to tell you about this is that there are endangered 
species in your town. You may know about it, you may not know about it. You look at this map, you're going to say, HS, that's holy smoke. I didn't know that. And half of these places are going to be on highways, roads, and half are going to be out somewhere else. But when you see that crosshatch, <coughs> that should be a warning to you that there is an endangered species. It can be anything from a moth to a turtle, a salamander, uh, you name them. They're in there. And you won't know because this does not tell you. Somebody's going to tell you if they know that you're in an endangered species area. The NDDB is the Natural Diversity Database. All this thing is is a database, which is picturing where it is in your town. And if you think you might have a problem, you might want to get in touch with the DEP and call 860-424-3011. Tell them what you're going to be doing. As a commercial applicator and doing water, I have to deal with this in every permit I get. I have to make sure there's nothing there. So I want you to keep this in mind. This is a definite problem that you may have in the future. Right now, you want to know your father has a, does he do aquatic work? No. No. Well, a lot of harborists don't do that because of the baloney that's involved when you're in a stream, wetland, pond, or lake. Now, in your towns, you have those. And you're going to be going by those. Some of these are going to have knotweed nearby. So you want to be careful what you're doing there. The worst thing you'll need is an NDD, NDDB review. I hope you don't need that. If you do and you have a problem, and you give me a call because I'm an expert at dealing with that, that page and what you need to do, maybe to get permission to do a piece of road that you didn't think you were not going to be able to do. The public water supply. In your packet, you get this on one of those pages on the top. See it? This is from Massachusetts to New Milford. All these little blue dots. Those are what they call public water supply service areas. What does that mean to you? That means, in, give me an example, in New Milford, because that's on top here, that's what it looks like right here. That's the town. But there's only these little dots all over the place. Now, interestingly, from New Milford, and you know how his mayor down there, he says, what the hell is this one? It's got two dots that are on top of each other. And then I realized it's a trailer park. They have their own, their own well and their own water system for everybody that lives there. You should know that. You should be aware where these people have their wells and whether or not there's a potential of you contaminating them. That's for your info, and I give you that uh, as a part of your education today. Now, about the public water supply, at the tie-in, glyphosate. We're really talking about glyphosate here today. We're not talking about a triclopyr, a mazapyr, or any other uh, aquatic uh, material that you might think you want to use. We want you to use the glyphosate because for the following reasons. Glyphosate, if it gets on the soil, does not move. And it is rendered useless. In other words, you could spray down the soil, go back, get a shovel, probably put that in a pot, put a geranium in there, and it will live. All right? So keep that in mind when people nail you for an herbicide. It's rain fast in probably an hour. So if you guys have got stuff in your uh, tank and you spray it out and it looks like it's going to rain, get one of these things. Find out when that event is coming 
try to quit about an hour and a half before. Let the thing dry, and then you'll be all right. That's the nice thing about it. The glyphosate only affects green tissue. Okay, so if you're spraying, you know, you do a driveway or something, you want to go out and you want to empty your tank out in the driveway because you got a gallon left. You could do that because it'll go into the soil, but you won't kill any weeds unless you have green weeds there. Now, you've seen the ad for Roundup where the guy is using glyphosate and they show you the weed wilting. But he, in that Roundup, he, catch me here now, Roundup, 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 Roundup. There are a lot of different kinds of Roundup. Roundup, the old one, just killed green tissue. And so that's what you want to spray it on. Now, if you use a stuff you can buy in uh, Home Depot for poison ivy and brush, or the one they use for cracks in your walkway or your flagstones, that has dipole in it, the flagstone, and the one for the brush has tricopier. It still says Roundup, same thing, but you think it is the same. Read the damn label. Read the little ingredients. See what you have in there. Yes, sir? Um, I know that uh, Don Reed has a two and a half gallon jug of glyphosate uh, in the office. And it's, what, what, do you remember the name of that product, Don? Probably Roundup Pro Concentrate. Green Sweep? Okay, so it's just a, 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 a glyphosate uh, aftermarket. It's not a Roundup product. And I, I suspect... I'm going to get to that. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Because I thought you were going to talk about RTU, ready to use, that your grandma buys. And she gets a little pump in there and pumps it up and she does it, all the stuff with it. That's nice. Fairly safe, diluted, can't use it. Might as well throw the thing out and buy another one. But you can buy, you can buy Rodeo, which is glyphosate, made by Monsanto and Albert, but that has no spreader sticker in it, and it's the spreader sticker in the original Roundup that was causing the accusation of being a carcinogen. That document, by the way, is in the left pocket of your packets, and it's a description of glyphosate by the Nature Conservancy. On the flip side, it explains the difference of glyphosate itself and glyphosate with surfactants called tallowamines. But it's in the packet. Can we use Rodeo? You can use Rodeo. You can use Rodeo. And I use Aquanine, a little cheaper, less expensive, excuse me. Not cheap, Absolutely. less expensive. Uh, same percentage in the jug. Yeah. Okay? But I use my own spreader sticker that I buy from Signet Enterprise, which is one that is okay by EPA for putting back into the Roundup or glyphosate or rodeo or whatever you buy. Do you sell the rodeo? It's pretty hard to get. Well, you have to go to a the provider of the chemical question? I was just gonna say, I think you mentioned Lesco. Yeah, okay. Now Lesco or site one, site one down and off. Is a good one to get the aquanine? They can provide that. You know, um, in, in larger... You can get it from Lesco, site one. Yeah. Um, you're gonna have to go online. There are other arborist suppliers that will have that. And I buy it from Signet because they're they're for aquatic, and since I do a lot of wetlands work. I need one that will deal with aquatics. Bob, uh, is that a general use herbicide rodeo? Can that be acquired by someone who doesn't have a license? Yeah. Yes. It's all, it's all a caution label. It's just a little harder to get. You might have to call in, see if the guy wants to stock it for you or have it shipped to you. Uh, you might even go online and buy this stuff. If you're really swift, you can uh, do it illegally. A lot of these chemicals, like somehow, how do, how do guys do it that? Oh, I can get that. Oh, yeah, how? Oh, I send it to my nephew, you know, in New Jersey. Yeah. Then I go down. It's available yeah. at Tractor Supply. Yeah. 
You can get things in tractor supply. You can get, and, 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 and in gallons, two gallons, two and a half. You can get stuff like that in uh, Home Depot. Probably not two and a half gallon. But be, my point is you gotta read the label. You gotta know what you're putting in there. What do you recommend, Bob? Hmm? What do you recommend? Well, glyphos say like a 41% and a spreader sticker that actually is a adjuvant that is not only a spreader sticker, but is a uh, penetrant. It goes right into the system. That's what we want, something good. Something, something that goes right in it. So this Signet stuff is probably stronger than the glyphosate. And uh, you put that in there, you don't need much. But what it does, it makes water wetter. No more beating on the plant. And like when you polish your car, no more rolling off of the water. It's like putting a detergent on. And so you want to get a good spreader sticker. Spreader sticker. Some of the information you get in, in, the, in the packet will say get a non-ionic surfactant. Non-ionic surfactant. Comes in one gallon. Follow the directions. Put it in according to the gallon mix you have. Okay. PPE. Since you're handling this stuff, we like you to dress like I am, long sleeves, this, heavy shoes, maybe waterproof shoes. You can get out and walk through this stuff. Rubber gloves, I buy more quality uh, natural. These are good for me. But I've got a box of uh, El Cheapos that if we're going to use my system. So I'll give you a pair of gloves. They're extra, extra large. Should fit on most hands. Uh, you can have the goggles. You can have a face mask with qualified filters. You can get glasses. I don't recommend, I wear glasses. I don't recommend that. But I wear this guy. This is basically because if I'm going to put it on and I have a guy that can hear me my muffle, I can put this thing on and I'm sealed all the way down. Right up there. I can put if I want to, here we go. Oh, here we go. I can put a face shield on. It comes like, you know, belt and suspenders. But uh, I don't do that. I wear that. I get pretty much the coverage I want. You can do a lot of things. But remember, this you're dealing with one of the safest herbicides that you can get. I'm not saying take a bath in it. I'm going to give you this analogy. If it takes 85 cups of coffee at one sitting to poison you, how many cups would you have to drink of your diluted mix of uh, glyphosate in your spray tank to kill you? All right? So just think about that. Uh, I'm going to tell that about LD50. The lethal dose to kill 50% of a population. Okay, so we got a population here. And I'm going to say, well, we're going to figure out what that, that thing is, that LD50 is on something. So we're going to treat this population with stuff until we kill half of it. But that means the rest of you are alive. Now, what, what am I really talking about? I'm saying that they tested on animals by increasing the dose until they killed 50% of the test population. Then they kept going to the point where they get 100%. So they kind of know that extreme. 50% is an LD50. This gives you a measurement of that it only kills half of what you're trying to kill, your target. So you've got to put more in. The yes, Nature sir. Conservancy description is very simple. It just says relatively 
uh, non-toxic to animals and fish. So it's, it's a low toxicity herbicide. Low toxicity, it's still toxic. And yeah, the people yeah, yeah, that yeah. Are gonna think uh, about that all the time. And you're gonna be handling that, and you're gonna come home with your pants all crapped up or your shirt or whatever is smelly, <clears throat> and you're gonna give that to your wife, and you got kids, you gotta start thinking out of the box. And say, well, take your clothes off somewhere else, upside. I turn my stuff inside out, I pick them up, and I tell my wife, Look, wash these now, throw them in, and only do it in that one load, and then dry them and use them again if I want to. Usually I use them for a long time if I wash them. So you've got to be careful. This is toxicity. You have that symptom sheet. Did you get that one? The one that shows... What sheet got? It's called... This one... It's in the packet. Now, every one of these symptoms, probably each of you have had in your lifetime. A headache, dizziness, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, excessive sweating, chest pain, difficulty breathing, increased secretions from the nose, but they have your eyes and mouth, and muscle pain and cramping. And you, you know, don't kid yourself. You've all had it. You know what they are. Chemicals, overdoses, can give you these symptoms. So don't say, oh, I got a headache. You know, oh, you know, I just threw up. Some people are much more affected by chemicals than others. And so people you work with may get these symptoms and start going to their supervisor or their you know, what do you call it? What's the guy called now? The personal person? HR. Hmm? HR? Don't you have a guy that hires you and fires you? HR. Yeah. Yeah. So they go there and say, hey, I'm being poisoned. Be careful. Yeah. I do that only from not experience, but from realizing that it is a possibility. Right. <laughs> it's big. You want to take a look at all this stuff. Here's something I found that I got in one of these. How many times do you want to have to measure eight ounces in a four ounce cup? So you get an eight ounce cup and you got to have 16 ounces. You have a 16 ounce cup and you need, this one here is 64 ounces. This is the cup. Okay? This is the one you want. It has it in ounces and milliliters. Okay, this is the one. Go buy one of these and be able to see through it because what I do, because I'm, I got a guy, and you say, look, and we sit down and we read the label and we actually go over the dosage every freaking time. Just what we're doing, what are we doing today? We can put two and a half ounces per gallon. How many gallons do you need? Well, I think it's 10. No, I think it's 12. All right, we'll do 12. So how much do we need for 12? You need 24. Okay, I put my finger on 24, and I hold it up where I can see it. He's taller than I am. He pours it in. We're both wearing gloves. And we take that, pour that into the tank. Then we get to spread a sticker. Same deal, but we may need less, maybe eight ounces. But we do that, then we rinse this, pour it in. And we rinse it again. Where do we get the rinse water? We carry rinse bottles on the truck, in the boat. Rinse bottle, rinse, rinse, put them out. If you're worried about stuff that's uh, gonna get on you, you can use wipes. If you don't wanna wear my mask on your face, I have a load of these uh, handy wipes, you can use those. If you want to dress up, you can go buy extra large rain suits. You're going to get a cover off white Tyvek, like this good, this is pretty good. And you'll see whether you got spray on you or not, because that 
doesn't roll off too well. Did you and then this say was something a, about indicator was, die? Hmm? Did you say something about indicator die? Uh, yeah, I kept it in the truck because we use dye in all our, in all our spray. I'll show you maybe when we're down below. I don't like to bring it in here because <laughs> you don't want one spoil. drop yeah. of that stuff. And you know, you go like that and all of a sudden you know, you're sweating and you turn blue. So this is a this is a better one. This is blue, not as offensive. You can get the green, tan, brown. Uh, either, this is a full suit. This was for Adam Osborne. And uh, he bought his pants. He didn't want to wear a jacket. You know, and you get difficulties with individuals. Your supervisors know that. And you're going to dress these guys up, masks, gloves, rain suits. You can, you can all wear the shirts we can see you on the highway. I have in my truck the vests. So if I'm going to get in a situation that I think I want people to recognize that I'm not a jerk, you know, I want to look as official as possible. So I put one of those on. Okay. Uh, read the label. <coughs> I'm going to sit down here. I think in there, under item six, read the label. I put down here, poison warning caution on the first page with the LD50. You're dealing with caution uh, chemical. Warning and poison are two other, uh, two other classifications. Warning, you might have a harder time to buy. That's a... Uh, well, most of the stuff I use is caution. In my greenhouse and uh, insect and disease, or I've gotten into the warnings. I have never used the poison. Uh, that's a lie. Probably with my father in 1950, he was using uh, lead arsenic. Mix up, spray that. And my dad, Mr. Safety, put on the whole fedora, put a handkerchief around, told me to stand the hell over there and spray it on our fruit trees. So, yeah, I probably did use it. At Cornell, uh, when I became a county agent, I was supposed to do tests in a greenhouse. And a guy gave me Cystox. That's it. It's a killer. It's probably, it's not poison, it's probably one of those warnings. And I'll tell you what that did to me, and it takes more time, but it's very indicative, because I am 81, and I'm still alive. And I remember, I used to smoke. And after I did this study for aphids on lilies, I found that every time I lit up a cigarette, I'd throw up. I said, geez. Well, that was a good way to quit smoking. <coughs> <laughs> Let me tell you. And also, I quit doing those kind of studies unless they gave me, all they gave me was a pair of rubber gloves, no mask. Didn't tell me to watch out for this stuff. And that was one of the most painful poisons, cystox, that you could have. But in the late 50s, early 60s, that's what the hell they were to Next page for me. We're turning the page over. Environmental hazards. On the label, and you have an example of the label there, they tell you that there's a little box that says environmental hazard. If you read the ingredients, make sure it's what you want, the caution statement, go to environmental hazards. It'll tell you what you got to worry about. It'll also tell you about handling concentrates, what you really should be wearing while you're doing it up close. I do copper sulfate sometimes, and I don't let anybody near me when I open up a bag of copper sulfate granular, and I put that mask on, I put my gloves on, I put the container that I'm gonna fill on the ground, and then I get another container next to it because I got a 50 pound bag, and I slid it open, and I start pouring it. So, ah, what the hell? It's like corn feed, you know, cow feed. No, it puts dust out. 
and that dust you can see blowing all the way up. So I'm very, very, very careful. So you want to know how to handle your concentrates. Mixing rates. The mixing, the rates, and then the adjuvant. They're all listed on that label. I'm going to let you see the label when we're down below. I got a kind of an empty jug of, of uh, aquanine. I didn't want to bring in a 10 page label here. Then you really fall asleep. Aquanite is uh, the same concentration of glyphosate as rodeo, is that correct? Yeah, similar. 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 How, many, how many ounces of uh, rodeo or aquanite do you use per gallon? When I use aquanite, two. Two, yeah. For the uh, five percent. I believe that's I believe that's in the sheet. You gotta you gotta look that up because it'll it'll tell you what do you do with one gallon, ten gallons, or per acre. Now this funny thing, too much torque here, but I gotta see that? So that's a half now. So I'm gonna to open up for any questions up to this point or you want to No, keep no, going? no, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going because I'm almost done. Um, Never mind. Maybe you're going to speed me on. Uh, okay. We, I talked about adjuvants. The rates are on the label. You got to read that. Bring another guy with you when you're reading it and both agree on what you're doing. Because if you think that you remember it from yesterday, you won't. You'll see on my jug, sometimes I write down the rate for one gallon and the rate for 10 gallons of my normal use. It's on there. And then I say, well, that's what we're going to use. So I, have, I get up to 25 gallons or I start to get to, you know, weird numbers. I want a guy to sit down and start doing the math with me. I'm not that good. And there is one thing um, I'm going to talk about before we get out. Disposal, half and half life. Half-life in the soil is like almost zero. But half-life of glyphosate in water is anywhere from one hour to four hours. And that's because water, pond water, river water, has particulate matter in it, to some degree or another. That's number one. Uh, yes. So we mix up some you have to use it right away. It's no good tomorrow. That's what I'm getting to. That's my next thing. <coughs> it says there hydrolysis. But I want to get into disposal. Because a lot of times, you're going to get stuck with five gallons or one gallon material. So, anybody want to tell me what they do with it? And way back. Spray it on the driveway at the shop. Spray it on on where? Driveway. Glyphosate on a, your driveway, long driveway. Spray it. Spray it on the weeds that are on the driveway. It'll kill the stuff with green leaf. Yes. But you guys, what are you take it home and put it on the driveway? Got five gallons left over? Ten gallons? Or we got a 50 gallon tank? You might have a lot. I try to make my mix the one I'm going to use for that job. I try to, I can't put more in. I hate to tell you, I go and mix that next five gallons to finish up. Now, fill the tank at home or at the garage. Mix on site. Don't mix at the garage and drive to the job. Why? Because this is, my Sicilian says, Mrs. Gomez Gama is going to be there in the driveway when you take the hose off you start going by and she's going to call the cops and all this and you, all of a sudden you're going to be stopped. You're going to end up with 20 gallons or whatever in your tank. What are you going to do with it? Know this, that if you, your water could screw that chemical up in probably two to four hours anyhow. Every one of you are taking clean water on site, put material in there, and if you take a break and 
go in for lunch and you filled it up at 8 o'clock, still got stuff in there, by 2 in the afternoon, that glyphosate has been hydrolyzed. If it's high pH water, isn't that the issue primarily? It, that's the issue. But you should have your water tested and you want to know how fast it hydrolyzes. Now, that was given to me at a meeting like this, you know, for recertification, and everybody was like you, waiting for lunch. And uh, I got up as they were breaking for lunch, and I said to them, did you just say that the mix of glyphosate would be rendered useless in two to four hours? He said, yeah, it depends on the water. He says, so I don't think they've ever got that. And I said, that's why all my gardener friends say that Roundup doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work. You mixed it up, you did that little can over there, a gallon, you went out, sprayed some poison ivy, then did a little weed, then went over and talked to Mrs. Jones, and then did a transplant, then went in and had lunch, then came out after lunch, oh, it's still sunny, picked up the thing, had a half a gallon left, started spraying. Kill the ones sprayed first, that worked, but all the rest she sprayed, nothing. And this does this <coughs> constantly. And people with lousy water, and I'll tell you, Falls Village water at the high school that came out of that, now I think they have a drilled well now, but there was a source of water, and one day, I took my two and a half gallon jugs of water for a job I was doing from the Housatown Valley Regional High School. And I went to a job where I was giving, uh, I was treating elm trees by gravity flow using my knowledge of uh, maple syrup. So I made up my whole system and I had all these things, I had a big tank, so I, I needed another five gallons of mix, put the stuff in, and by the time it got down the hose into the little systems I had for each piece that I was injecting into, <coughs> it was crap. Clogged everything. I know the Salisbury uh, crew had a couple of questions. What was it that you wanted to ask? Well, we spray the roadside. What are you going to do beyond that right. for private? Yeah. What we do our roadsides, but beyond okay. that, you can't do private, private property. So what's going to happen with that? It's going to keep coming back on our side. Mm -hmm. You mean the, 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 okay? You hear what he said? Outside of the right of way yeah. is what he's asking. Yeah. That is the biggest problem. Yeah. I came up seven this morning. I saw the piece I left for the man that has a spring right next to the Stoney's garage. And it's got beautiful flowers. And I see they opened up so we can get to the spring. Look at it. We don't spray that. You cannot spray a water source within 50, you know, 50 feet and you spring or wellhead. Now, to answer your question, what are you going to do with the rest? You have to be like uh, Kathleen Nelson in Mile a Minute Vine. She goes onto the person's property, talks to him, and says, hey, well, she was doing Mile a Minute. You have Mile a Minute here. Now, we'll pull it for you. Where is she? Uh, we should have her here. She's my age. <laughs> we should have her here. No. Jeff, look, let me expand on that a little bit. Uh, it, it, there's an interesting parallel in community forestry where you can do setback planting on streetscape trees if you're planting along a public road. road. Uh, I don't think that there's a provision in the law for setback spraying, but I think in Canaan we found that, hey, we, we try to talk to the neighbors and figure out the uh, agreement and uh, in we some cases the they need to hire someone to do the job. In other cases I know that Steve Geddes, like at the top of Smith Hill in that curve there, he keeps pushing it back gradually a little more each year and he's not getting any objections and uh, you know he's almost to the back of that not be patch now. You, it, it's a tricky judgment call. I, I'd be careful because things are getting more litigious, number one, Number two, the DE, D 
the deep boys and girls, they're short-handed. God help us if they ever got a full stamp at, uh, at the chemical tree, at the chemical licensing thing. Okay, question. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, you were mentioning rights of way, you know, like long highways. Do all the towns have equal rights of way? In other words, you know, in other words, 10 feet, 20 feet, 15 feet, because, you know, that would be something you'd have to consider, I would guess, if you're treating yeah, it. That's all over town. Yes, you've got to consider that right of way, whether you're mowing and whether you're going to go off that right of way. To, to, I got a neighbor, he screams it from the Wilford guys for cutting what he considers his multiflora rose bush. <laughs> but my, my point is that be careful, I'm going to get to that in just a second. You got a Question? Help the town crews be applying with backpacks or with some other form of application? Town crews are doing it apparently by, by a power yeah, spray in most cases. Yeah. Like a boom? <laughs> hmm? Like a boom or? No. Probably not. Still using I, you, If you start to try to do a lot of stuff, putting a lot of things down, be careful. All right, I got water. I got you fill at home, bring your own water if you can, extra water, bring wash water, carry it in jugs, you can wash yourself. Um, this is what commercial people do. They put that on every entry where a person might come in. This is what I have to do if I do aquatic work. All right, I gotta put that, post that sign. Tell them what I did, the time I did it. Tell them what, you know, tell them all the things that they can't deal with by the hour for the water. No swimming, no irrigation, no fishing, no livestock. Livestock, I write, no dogs in the water. Bob, it's quarter after. Do you think we should just ask for any other questions and then rock, grab some of the equipment? And We're not. I'm going to finish up. <laughs> um, Let's make sure. I want to get you to the last thing. Licensing, number nine. Open that, pack it up. You're going to see this. If you're interested, this thing here is an application form and a handbook to become, they call you a junior operator's certificate. We call them an operator. Read that. If, if you can get that exam, you're going to be a safe applicator. If you want your guys in town to be, quote, certified, this is the simplest certification that you can do. It costs 100 bucks, and the uh, certificate license lasts for five years. I'm not going to sell that to you now. I'm not going to tell you to do it. It's just, possible that any member of a town crew is uh, permitted by the EEP to apply herbicides within the town rights of way. As without a, a license? As, a, as an employee. That's correct. So all of you, you right now uh, are able to do that. But let me tell you, the time will come. I read the, uh, the laws that go into the session legislature. There's always a law in there saying there will be no chemical application on state highways or public ground public. And they make it to the right of way. So what are you going to do about stop signs? What are you going to do about guardrails? You, you don't have enough prisoners. Fortunately, the Connecticut DOT has remained firm and their efforts to counteract some of those restrictions in the state legislature. And uh, other than our vegetation limitations, we continue to treat state guardrails <coughs> with herbicide in, in, in our district for that happened this year. Let's not live in a fool's paradise because schools, Housatonic, uh, because it has an ag center, can do some, some, some chemical work. Because there are a lot of schools with playgrounds, you cannot do that. Forbidden. So you have to, the, the guys that mow the lawns and fertilize have to use a completely different deal. We haven't talked about 
and you may very briefly want to talk about the biological control for not only say that in one minute um, there is a u.s department of agriculture research effort on the biological control of not read it had gotten to the stage of public comment i submitted supportive comment this summer and um, it releases if approved a japanese insect called a Athelaria dory, it's a little sap sucking insect. And if it was successful in establishing in our region, um, though this is years into the future, uh, it will convert the invasivity of that plant to more like a regular plant that has to deal with certain realities of life and then becomes less competitive. Uh, but in the meantime, we feel we need to use the tools that are available to us to reduce the insult of this, you know, insatiable appetite of this plant on our landscape. Hopefully, there will be a relief on the horizon down the road where things, a certain equilibrium will reestablish and we can back off. I would add one comment in terms of uh, evaluating uh, quantity of chemistry. One of the interesting things about having a four gallon backpack sprayer is you don't have 10 gallons left in your 25 gallon tank. And I, I, I must say that with this little guy, one and a half gallons at the stage we're at in Canaan now, this is about all we need for spot treatment going back to these sites. So I wouldn't over go over capacity. Um, and I would add one thing in terms of a priority, which we will emphasize down below, which is in each town, your first priority is getting your fill gravel pit areas under control. Those should be free of knotweed, and uh, because you're shooting yourself in the foot every time you load that stuff up. And you remember that only that little half inch fragment is all you need to start a new plant. And um, that's preventive medicine for the rest of your town. Um, and, where else do you want to go? Always have spare parts. I'm talking to the guys in the front. Backpacks, small gallonage, you can carry those too. Because mm -hmm. that'll, you want to do spot treats, and you got to do it around a stop sign. That's the way to do it. Remember, half life, hydrolysis, you only have, guys, four hours. So I'm going to bring these down. I'm going to bring this thing down. I want to thank you for listening to me. We're going down. I'm going to grab my truck down. We're going to have some of you get involved in. If you've never done it, you can do it with us. We're going to go do that now. Any other questions? <coughs> the other side of the state, up to Rhode Island. And uh, one solution I see that people are going with it, they made a hedge, or had a trimmed hedge on it. And it didn't look bad. So, I mean, you can't yeah. beat it, join it. Yeah, and beekeepers, <laughs> if it's growing along an air fence row, they, they like it. Okay? So you're, you're right. You can, I don't know if I really want to have my whole backyard box, you know, boxwood trimmed knotweed. Yeah, on the other, and, and that's one of the attractions of knotweed, which was one of the reasons for its introduction. Hey, pretty flowers could be used as a hedgerow, um, <clears throat> could stabilize a, a cut, a bank cut, stuff like that. But it just turns out it's, the plant keeps moving out. You know, there's a hedgerow down under Cornwall Bridge, under the lower area below the bridge. It's now gotten across the railroad track and it's moving toward the river. So um, in England, as we understand, if you want to sell your property, you've got to control your knotweed before you can do that. There, be, and quite honestly, uh, I know of examples of, hey, where this neighbor's got knotweed, Hey, we, the DOT knotweed is going under the fence of a Green Acres house and coming up in their yard. We treated that last year. Um, so it becomes a nuisance plant that it's, a hedge trimmer may not be the management tool ultimately. You may have to revert to herbicide. So I think we're going to go out. Where did Bob go? And we're going to, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk out, let's say, the main door 
We're going to go down the next driveway, which is directly behind to the pit here, and do some demonstrations. So, 